Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring to life the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is now available as a podcast on YouTube and via our Patreon page, where there are additional stories exclusively for our patrons. Please do check out the link in the description if you're interested in that. This week we return to the Hyborian Age and the bloody barbaric world of Conan the Barbarian. This story, The Gods of the North, although first titled The Frost Giant's Daughter, is chronologically the earliest Conan story there is, before he heads south to seek his fortune, before the pirating, the pillaging and the ruling of kingdoms. Here in the frosty north, Conan is a southerner, whereas in later stories he is very much a northern barbarian and treated as such. This is a simple tale playing on the ideas in Thomas Bullfinch's Outline of Mythology and the Greek myth of the Sirens. The twist is that the protagonist, Conan here, is driven mad not by some idealised love from Cupid's arrow, but by a base lust, very Conan, and it doesn't reflect well on him. As is often the case, he isn't a very sympathetic character here. The result is sometimes perhaps charitably considered a morality tale. I'll leave it to you to decide whether that was the author's original intention. In any event, the gods of the North are not to be taken lightly, not even by a Chimerian barbarian. By way of a content warning, this is a Conan story, so expect everything you would expect from a Conan story. Violence, objectification and a bleak outlook on life. And the language, rousing, exhilarating and poetic, is also everything you would expect from Robert E. Howard. So, pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy The Gods of the North by Robert E. Howard. Across the red drifts and mail-clad forms, two figures glared at each other. In that utter desolation, only they moved. The frosty sky was over them, the white, illimitable plain around them, the dead men at their feet. Slowly through the corpses they came, as ghosts might come to a tryst through the shambles of a dead world. In the brooding silence, they stood face to face. Both were tall men, built like tigers. Their shields were gone, their corslets battered and dinted. Blood dried on their mail, their swords were stained red. Their horned helmets showed the marks of fierce strokes. One was beardless and black-maned. The locks and beard of the other were red as the blood on the sunlit snow. Man, said he. Tell me your name, so that my brothers in Vanaheim may know who was the last of Wulfhir's band to fall before the sword of Heimdall. Not in Vanaheim, growled the black-haired warrior, but in Valhalla will you tell your brothers that you met Conan of Chimeria. Heimdall roared and leapt, and his sword flashed in deathly arc. Conan staggered, and his vision was filled with red sparks as the singing blade crashed on his helmet, shivering into bits of blue fire. But as he reeled, he thrust with all the power of his broad shoulders behind the humming blade. The sharp point tore through brass scales and bones and heart, and the red-haired warrior died at Conan's feet. The Chimerian stood upright, trailing his sword, a sudden sick weariness assailing him. The glare of the sun on the snow cut his eyes like a knife, and the sky seemed shrunken and strangely apart. He turned away from the trampled expanse where yellow-bearded warriors lay locked with red-haired slayers in the embrace of death. A few steps he took, and the glare of the snowfields was suddenly dimmed. A rushing wave of blindness engulfed him, and he sank down into the snow, supporting himself on one mailed arm, seeking to shake the blindness out of his eyes as a lion might shake his mane. A silvery laugh cut through his dizziness, and his sight cleared slowly. He looked up. There was a strangeness about all the landscape that he could not place or define, an unfamiliar tinge to earth and sky. But he did not think long of this. Before him, swaying like a sapling in the wind, stood a woman. 
Her body was like ivory to his dazed gaze, and, save for a light veil of gossamer, she was naked as the day. Her slender, bare white feet were whiter than the snow they spurned. She laughed down at the bewildered warrior. Her laughter was sweeter than the rippling of silvery fountains, and poisonous with cruel mockery. "'Who are you?' asked the Cimmerian. "'Whence came you?' What matter? Her voice was more musical than a silver-stringed harp, but it was edged with cruelty. Call up your men, said he, grasping his sword. Yet, though my strength fail me, they shall not take me alive. I see you are of the Vanir. Have I said so? His gaze went again to her unruly locks, which at first glance he had thought to be red. Now he saw that they were neither red nor yellow but a glorious compound of both colours. He gazed, spellbound. Her hair was like elfin gold. The sun struck it so dazzlingly that he could scarcely bear to look upon it. Her eyes were likewise neither wholly blue nor wholly grey, but of shifting colours and dancing lights and clouds of colours he could not define. Her full red lips smiled, and from her slender feet to the blinding crown of her billowy hair, her ivory body was as perfect as the dream of a god. Conan's pulse hammered in his temples. "'I cannot tell,' said he, "'whether you are of Vanaheim and mine enemy, or of Asgard and my friend. Far I have wandered, but a woman like you I have never seen. Your locks blind me with their brightness. Never have I seen such hair, not even among the fairest daughters of the Aesir, by a mere. Why, who are you to swear by a mere? she mocked. What know you of the gods of ice and snow? You who have come up from the south to adventure among an alien people? By the dark gods of my own race, he cried in anger, though I am not one of the golden-haired Aesir, none has been more forward in swordplay. This day I have seen fourscore men fall, and I alone have survived the field where Wolfhir's reavers met the wolves of Bragi. Tell me, woman, have you seen the flash of mail out across the snow plains, or seen armed men moving upon the ice? I have seen the hoarfrost glittering in the sun, she answered. I have heard the wind whispering across the everlasting snows. He shook his head with a sigh. Niord should have come up with us before the battle joined. I fear he and his fighting men have been ambushed. Wolf here and his warriors lie dead. I had thought there was no village within many leagues of this spot, for the war carried us far, but you cannot have come a great distance over these snows, naked as you are. Lead me to your tribe, if you are of Asgard, for I am faint with blows and the weariness of strife. My village is further than you can walk, Conan of Chimeria, she laughed. Spreading her arms wide, she swayed before him, her golden head lolling sensuously, her scintillant eyes half-shadowed beneath their long, silken lashes. Am I not beautiful, O oh man? Like dawn running naked on the snows, he muttered, his eyes burning like those of a wolf. Then why do you not rise and follow me? Who is the strong warrior who falls down before me? She chanted in maddening mockery. Lie down and die in the snow with the other fools, Conan of the Black Hair. You cannot follow where I would lead. With an oath, the Chimerian heaved himself up on his feet, his blue eyes blazing, his dark, scarred face contorted. Rage shook his soul, but desire for the taunting figure before him hammered at his temples and drove his wild blood fiercely through his veins. Passion fierce as physical agony flooded his whole being, so that earth and sky swam red to his dizzy gaze. In the madness that swept upon him, weariness and faintness were swept away. He spoke no word as he drove at her, fingers spread to grip her soft flesh. With a shriek of laughter, she leapt back and ran, laughing at him over her white shoulder. With a low growl, Conan followed. He had forgotten the fight, forgotten the mailed warriors who lay in their blood, forgotten Niord and the reavers who had failed to reach the fight. He had thought only for the slender white shape which seemed to float rather than run before him. 
Out across the white blinding plain the chase led, the trampled red field fell out of sight behind him, but still Conan kept on with the silent tenacity of his race. His mailed feet broke through the frozen crust, he sank deep into the drifts and forged through them by sheer strength. But the girl danced across the snow, light as a feather floating across a pool. Her naked feet barely left their imprint on the hoarfrost that overlaid the crust. In spite of the fire in his veins, the cold bit through the warrior's mail and fur-lined tunic, but the girl in her gossamer veil ran as lightly and as gaily as if she danced through the palm and rose gardens of Poitain. On and on she led, and Conan followed. Black curses drooled through the Cimmerian's parched lips. The great veins in his temples swelled and throbbed and his teeth gnashed. You cannot escape me, he roared. Lead me into a trap and I'll pile the heads of your kinsmen at your feet. Hide from me and I'll tear apart the mountains to find you. I'll follow you to hell. A maddening laughter floated back to him, and foam flew from the barbarian's lips. Further and further into the wastes she led him. The land changed. The wide plains gave way to low hills, marching upward in broken ranges. Far to the north he caught a glimpse of towering mountains, blue with the distance or white with the eternal snows. Above these mountains shone the flaring rays of the Borealis. They spread fanwise into the sky, frosty blades of cold flaming light, changing in colour, growing and brightening. Above him the skies glowed and crackled with strange lights and gleams. The snow shone weirdly, now frosty blue, now icy crimson, now cold silver. Through a shimmering icy realm of enchantment, Conan plunged doggedly onward, in a crystalline maze where the only reality was the white body dancing across the glittering snow beyond his reach, ever beyond his reach. He did not wonder at the strangeness of it all, not even when two gigantic figures rose up to bar his way. The scales of their mail were white with hoarfrost, their helmets and their axes were covered with ice, snow sprinkled their locks, in their beards were spikes of icicles, their eyes were cold as the lights that streamed above them. "'Brothers!' cried the girl, dancing between them. "'Look who follows! I have brought you a man to slay! Take his heart!' that we may lay it smoking on our father's board. The giants answered with roars like the grinding of icebergs on a frozen shore, and heaved up their shining axes as the maddened Chimerian hurled himself upon them. A frosty blade flashed before his eyes, blinding him with its brightness, and he gave back a terrible stroke that sheared through his foe's thigh. With a groan, the victim fell and at the instant Conan was dashed into the snow, his left shoulder numb from the blow of the survivor, from which the Chimerian's mail had barely saved his life. Conan saw the remaining giant looming high above him like a colossus carved of ice, etched against the cold, glowing sky. The axe fell to sink through the snow and deep into the frozen earth as Conan hurled himself aside and leaped to his feet. The giant roared and wrenched his axe free, but even as he did, Conan's sword sang down. The giant's knees bent, and he sank slowly into the snow, which turned crimson with the blood that gushed from his half-severed neck. Conan wheeled to see the girl standing a short distance away, staring at him in wide-eyed horror, all the mockery gone from her face. She cried out fiercely, and the blood drops flew from his sword as his hand shook in the intensity of his passion. Call the rest of your brothers, he cried. I'll give their hearts to the wolves. You cannot escape me. With a cry of fright, she turned and ran fleetly. She did not laugh now, nor mock him over her white shoulder. She ran as for her life, and though he strained every nerve and thew until his temples were like to burst and the snow swam red to his gaze, she drew away from him, dwindling in the witchfire of the skies until she was a figure no bigger than a child. Then a dancing white flame on the snow, then a dim blur in the distance. 
but grinding his teeth until the blood started from his gums, he reeled on, and he saw the blur grow to a dancing white flame, and the flame to a figure big as a child, and then she was running, less than a hundred paces ahead of him, and slowly the space narrowed, foot by foot. She was running with effort now, her golden locks blowing free. He heard the quick panting of her breath, and saw a flash of fear in the look she cast over her white shoulder. The grim endurance of the barbarian had served him well. The speed ebbed from her flashing white legs. She reeled in her gait. In his untamed soul leapt up the fires of hell she had fanned so well. With an inhuman roar, he closed in on her, just as she wheeled with a haunting cry, and flung out her arms to fend him off. His sword fell into the snow as he crushed her to him. Her lithe body bent backwards as she fought with desperate frenzy in his iron arms. Her golden hair blew about his face, blinding him with its sheen. The feel of her slender body twisting in his male arms drove him to blinder madness. His strong fingers sank deep into her smooth flesh, and that flesh was cold as ice. It was as if he embraced not a woman of human flesh and blood, but a woman of flaming ice. She writhed her golden head aside, striving to avoid the fierce kisses that bruised her red lips. "'You are cold as the snows,' he mumbled dazedly. "'I will warm you with the fire in my blood.' With a scream and a desperate wrench, she slipped from his arms, leaving her single gossamer garment in his grasp. She sprang back and faced him, her golden locks in wild disarray, her white bosom heaving, her beautiful eyes blazing with terror. For an instant he stood frozen, awed by her terrible beauty, as she posed naked against the snows. And in that instant she flung her arms towards the lights that glowed in the skies above her, and cried out in a voice that rang in Conan's ears for ever after. Ymir! Oh, my father! Save me! Conan was leaping forward, his arms spread to seize her, when, with a crack like the breaking of an ice mountain, the whole skies leapt into icy fire. The girl's ivory body was suddenly enveloped in a cold blue flame, so blinding that the Chimerian threw up his hands to shield his eyes from the intolerable blaze. A fleeting instant, skies and snowy hills were bathed in crackling white flames, blue darts of icy light and frozen crimson fires. Then Conan staggered and cried out. The girl was gone. The glowing snow lay empty and bare. High above his head the witch lights flashed and played in a frosty sky gone mad. And among the distant blue mountains there sounded a rolling thunder as of a gigantic war chariot, rushing behind steeds whose frantic hooves struck lightning from the snows and echoes from the skies. And suddenly the Borealis, the snow-clad hills and the blazing heavens reeled drunkenly to Conan's sight. Thousands of fireballs burst with showers of sparks, and the sky itself became a titanic wheel which rained stars as it spun. Under his feet the snowy hills heaved up like a wave, and the Chimerian crumpled into the snows to lie motionless. In a cold, dark universe whose sun was extinguished eons ago, Conan felt the movement of life, alien and unguessed. An earthquake had him in its grip, and it was shaking him to and fro, at the same time chafing his hands and feet until he yelled in pain and fury and groped for his sword. "'He's coming too, Horser,' said a voice. "'Haste! We must rub the frost out of his limbs if he's ever to wield sword again.' He won't open his left hand, growled another. He's clutching something. Conan opened his eyes and stared into the bearded faces that bent over him. He was surrounded by tall, golden-haired warriors in mail and furs. Conan, you live! By crumb, the odd, gasped the Chimerian. Am I alive, or are we all dead and in Valhalla? We live grunted the Aesir, busy over Conan's half-frozen feet. We had to fight our way through an ambush, or we had come up with you before the battle was joined. The corpses were scarce cold when we came upon the field. We did not find you among the dead, so we followed your spoor. In Emir's name, Conan, why did you wander off into the wastes of the north? 
We have followed your tracks in the snow for hours. Had a blizzard come up and hidden them, we'd never have found you by Amir. Swear not so often by Amir, uneasily muttered a warrior, glancing at the distant mountains. This is his land, and the god bides among yonder mountains, the legends say. I saw a woman, Conan answered hazily. We met Braggy's men on the plains. I know not how long we fought. I alone lived. I was dizzy and faint. The land lay like a dream before me. Only now do all things seem natural and familiar. A woman came and taunted me. She was beautiful as a frozen flame from hell. A strange madness fell upon me when I looked at her, so I forgot all else in the world. I followed her. Did you not find her tracks, or the giants in icy mail I slew? Niord shook his head. We only found your tracks in the snow, Conan. Then it may be I am mad, said Conan dazedly. Yet you yourself are no more real to me than was the golden-locked witch who fled naked across the snows before me. Yet from under my very hands she vanished in icy flame. He is delirious, whispered a warrior. Not so, cried an older man whose eyes were wild and weird. It was Atali, the daughter of Ymir, the frost giant. To fields of the dead she comes and shows herself to the dying. Myself, when a boy I saw her, when I lay half slain on the bloody field of Woolraven. I saw her walk among the dead in the snows, her naked body gleaming like ivory, and her golden hair unbearably bright in the moonlight. I lay and howled like a dying dog because I could not crawl after her. She lures men from stricken fields into the wastelands to be slain by her brothers, the ice giants, who lay men's red hearts smoking on Emir's board. The Chimerian has seen Atali, the frost giant's daughter. Bah, grunted Horsa. Old Gorm's mind was touched in his youth by a sword cut on the head. Conan was delirious from the fury of battle. Look how his helmet is dented. Any of those blows might have addled his brain. It was a hallucination he followed into the wastes. He is from the south. What does he know of Atali? You speak truth, perhaps, muttered Conan. It was all strange and weird. By Crom! He broke off, glaring at the object that still dangled from his clenched left fist. The other gaped silently at the veil he held up, a wisp of gossamer that was never spun by human hands. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed The Gods of the North by Robert E. Howard. If you'd like to hear more classic science fiction and fantasy stories, or just want to support The Well Told Tale, please do check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. We'll be back next week with a classic story from one of the legends of science fiction, Arthur C. Clarke. I hope you can join me. <laughs>